And happy December, NCAA basketball fans. This is your weekly Tromcast, two really old guys talking NCAA basketball. I'm Jeff Sink. I'm here with my good friend Jim Reeker. And how you doing on this gloomy, rainy, dank, dark, damp Cincinnati morning? Well, winter's moved in, and that's uh, for most people a bad thing. But let's look at the let's look at the positive side, Jeff. Means we're getting deeper into the NCAA season, and the games are starting to mean a little bit more. You, you are correct on that, and uh, the prediction for a possible first snow here in Cincinnati on Saturday. We'll always get the kiddies all a, a Twitter and go from that. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! The snow. You're not done with your leaves yet, are you? You're, you're worried about no, that. I d- I did finish my leaves, so I am ready finally for winter. Okay. Well, a, a, a big week in a little bit. We're going to talk. We're going to go back to our, our conferences and see how they've been doing in the pre-conference schedule. But last week, a couple things that we, we left on the tables. We knew it would be a big week for for Baylor. <clears throat> they uh, were hosting. They had to come to Cincinnati and Xavier, and then they had to host Wichita State. Unfortunately, dropped both. Big week for Xavier, too. Not only that Baylor game, but the big game on Cincinnati, and they won both of those handily. We'll have a little bit more on that Cincinnati game toward the end of the, the trog cast. Um, Gonzaga won big over number 25, Creighton and Seton Hall. We said could work their way back into the top 25 and did with big wins against number 17, Louisville, and number 22, Texas Tech, both of whom now dropped out of the top 25. So like you just said, Jim, it, it, it's it's – Things are starting to weigh on the fulcrum, and we're seeing who the, the big daddies are and who's going on. So any you know minor thoughts, I'm sure you have a lot to say about the, the different conferences, uh, about what happened this past week. No, again, yeah, the, uh, the games are getting to be more important. And what we see now is, uh, you know, you have your preseason rankings, and everybody's kind of going on last year. But teams, of course, lose major players, gain some major, major players, coaches change. So, really, we're kind of now at the point where the top 25 kind of has shaken out, and I don't think we'll see any of the big swings anymore that we see. As most teams only playing uh, two games a week now, uh, there'll be minor movement up and down. Won't be anything like, you know, we had Arizona lost three in a row, dropped from number two all the way out of the rankings last week. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of those things, I'm sure we'll be covering a lot of those things as we go conference by conference. Jim covers the uh, – the Big East, the, the Big Ten, and the Big 12, he covers the bigs. So i got the, the, the Pac-12, the SEC, and the ACC. So if you want to go ahead and, and lead off, Jim, uh, who, who do you want to say? See, sort of what's going on sort of in these pre-conference games? Uh, you've still got a couple weeks before the conference games goes, but this usually sort of separates the week from the staff, so to say, a little bit. Well, I'm going to start with the Big Ten, and you just uh, said, yeah, we got a couple weeks till – the conference games start, but that's not true with the Big Ten this year. The Big Ten has already played two conference games, most of them. Some of them still got one, uh, I believe, tonight or, or later this week. And got me to thinking, why is the Big Ten throwing in two early games here? Because basically they all are going to play two league games early in December, which uh, you know is something to call into question how important these games might play out to be in the overall standings as teams are trying to set their lineup and get their feet. So I kind of looked into it because I hadn't heard why they were doing it. I thought maybe they had uh, expanded their league schedule. Maybe that was the reason. But no, what it comes out to be is the Big Ten won to play their conference tournament in New York City at Madison Square Garden. Uh, traditionally, they've played a lot of them at, uh, in Indianapolis. So, but because the Big East made a great marketing move when they reorganized four years ago, they uh, held on to the name the Big East, which was a great move on their part because of all the rich history of the Big East. And the other thing they set down was they extended their contract to always play their tournament at Madison Square Garden. So they have Madison Square Garden during the traditional conference schedule. So in order for the Big Ten to play theirs there, they had to try to end their conference season a week early. So the decision was made to throw in two conference games this week. So they'll have that extra week or or have an early start. And we'll be playing uh, their conference tournament, which will be interesting because if you recall in the past, the Big Ten's always been the one that's uh, kind of been one of the last championships played right before the selection show. 
So uh, that's why it's going on. But uh, and uh, yeah, I, I owe you one. I knew I was going to lose this, but you know, I had to be a good sport. But uh, Big Ten is kind of in flux right now, and in the ACC, which I think you're going to you're talking about today. Uh, they just hammered them in the uh, Big Ten ACC Challenge, 11 to three, and that really came at no surprise when I looked at those matchups. Uh, yeah, in fact, I thought it might have, it could have almost been worse. Uh, but to, just a quick rundown of what's going on. Michigan State, of course, is the top dog. Everybody's expecting them to win it, and in fact, in the ACC Challenge, uh, they blew out Notre Dame. Who I'm not sure where they fell or if they fell, but they were ranked, I think, as high as number six. Uh, but Michigan State took care of them fairly easily, and they look like they're, you know, odds on to be the champion again this year. Of course, Minnesota, we've talked about them. They've uh, played very, very well. I believe they're 8-1 and one at this time, although they are missing one of their top players, Dupre uh, McBrayer, who has a leg infection. And their only loss is to a very good Miami team. So they're looking good. Uh, Purdue just had a couple big wins, one over Arizona, one over Louisville. They should stay toward the top of the standings. Uh, of course, they lost uh, Swanigan last year, but got a lot of people back. Uh, in the middle, you kind of got Maryland, Northwestern, Michigan, Penn State, Iowa. Not much to say about them. Uh, Northwestern may be a little bit of a disappointment sitting at 5-4 and four right now. Of course, coming off that first NCAA tournament last year, a lot of people had higher expectations for them, but uh, they still got time to get it uh, uh, changed and organized. Biggest surprise of the conference probably is Ohio State. Of course, Ohio State has the new coach Chris Holtman, who came from Butler, and there weren't much, there weren't weren't many expectations for that program this year. And then when Butler actually beat them in a uh, one of those tournaments early on, everybody was kind of like, okay, this is the Ohio State we expected. But they have bounced back with two Big Ten wins already. In fact, one just coming last night, one that while I was flipping the channels, actually they were down fairly in double digits, but they came back to defeat the Michigan Wolverines. So they're sitting at 7-3 and three and 2-0. and oh. They got their first two uh, Big Ten early games out of the way, and they, they won both of them. So uh, Chris Holtman, we've talked about him many times on the show. We, I think he's a great coach. He did a great job at Butler, kind of uh, thrown into a situation late there. And actually, I guess he, he's got it down because he was thrown into this situation a little late because they didn't fire Thad Mata, you remember, until last summer. So he kind of took on the program a little late, but it seems to be turning the corner with him. So we got to watch the Buckeyes. Looks like they're going to be tough. Uh, Wisconsin, you look at them, a little bit of a, you know, a, a program that's been heralded. They knew it was going to be a tough season for them. They lost a lot. Ethan Happ's really the only returning starter back, but – uh, don't go to sleep on the Badgers because if you look at their losses, they lost to uh, Xavier, Baylor, UCLA, uh, and Virginia, and uh, also then uh, to that surprise Ohio State team. So even though their record's not looking good right now, I think Gary Gard will have them uh, back at least toward the middle of the pack of the Big Ten by the time we get back heavy into the conference schedule. And uh, Indiana had, uh, you know, Archie Miller, he's kind of in the same position, kind of a uh, new situation, and the Hoosiers got off to a rocky start. But they beat Iowa last night, so that's a positive. They're sitting at one and one. And I, I look for Archie Miller to, again, move the Hoosiers up to the middle of the pack and give him a couple of years, and he'll probably have the Hoosiers uh, contending again for uh, the NCAA, or actually the Big Ten championship. So that's just a quick run of the, the Big Ten. Big Ten's Overall, it's kind of down this year, but I think that was kind of expected. But, of course, the big dog, Michigan State, a lot of people saying that uh, they definitely are final four material, if not uh, a challenger for the national championship. So who do you want to talk about, Jeff? Well, I have just a couple quick thoughts on it. Wisconsin, is, you know, you're right. They're, they're down to four of their five losses are to ranked teams and the other ones to – Ohio State, so you're right. I think they'll be back by the end of the year, that discipline they have up there. And uh, Michigan State, everybody sort of poo-pooed them for playing such a harsh schedule at the beginning of last year. They're doing the same thing this year. They're just having a little bit better results. So you're going to see them both there. there there's no doubt about it. You sort of started with your, your weaker conference, and I will gladly collect our ice cream sundae, our favorite cold beverage, for winning the the challenge again, but there will be 
many other bets down the road. I'm going to start with the, the weaker of my three as well. Um, it's uh, it's the Pac-12. And uh, you may remember last year in our preview, I prayed for the Pac-12 to be relevant again, and, and they actually answered that prayer. Four strong efforts going down to the NCAA. You know, Arizona was the number two seed and went to the Sweet 16. UCLA, number three seed, <coughs> lost to Kentucky in the Sweet 16. USC had to play in. But they upset MSU and almost toppled Baylor. And, of course, Oregon ended up going to the, the, the final game. But now, oh, how the mighty have fallen. I mean, they're 2-5 and five against top 25 teams. You mentioned Arizona was expected to challenge for the best team in the nation. And they're out of the top 25 at 5-3. and three. I mean, it's not that they've, they've lost to cupcakes. But they did lose that three in a row to Purdue, North Carolina State, and Southern Methodist. But they also almost lost to... UNLV went into overtime, and uh, I think they they could get back off the schneid tonight. They they, they play a blossoming Texas A&M squad, and uh, and then they also have to deal with Alabama before starting league play against uh, Arizona State, who's been a pleasant surprise on December 30th. UCLA is at seven and one, but they've been uh, engulfed in their own little soap opera. I think that distraction, luckily, is about to go away. Shoplifting issues in China led to the suspension of three recruits. They were able to eke out wins against Georgia, Central Arkansas in overtime. Yeah, you heard that right. Not the Arkansas Razorbacks, but the Central Arkansas Bears in overtime. And they were able to to top that uh, scrappy Wisconsin team you talked about. And they have... Michigan, Cincinnati, and Kentucky all before starting conference play against Washington State. And luckily, like I said, I think that part of that big distraction has now left. Like I said earlier, I, I don't intend to, to mention the man's name. And it's even the, the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came out and said it's all about him. Even the Los Angeles Lakers have had to enforce different uh, rules on access to the court and access to media because of him. And I think uh, that will take a lot of pressure off of Alford shoulders and UCLA up and get, get back to just playing basketball. USC has been able to hold on by their fingertips to the top 25, even though they've uh, suffered back-to-back -back losses to Texas A&M and uh, SMU. SMU, a pleasant surprise out of the American with some of these wins. But I think Andy Enfield will have them back. It's just it's a down here. Oregon, the fourth team, five and three, no signature wins. Losses to a depleted UConn, Oklahoma, and Boise State. And again, you heard that right again, Boise State. And this wasn't a football game on the Smurf turf. This was basketball. And they, they don't really play anybody before they hit the Utah Utes in Pac-12 play. The pleasant surprise out there has been Arizona State Sun Devils and Bobby Hurley. They're up to number 13, 7-0. They're the only undefeated Pac-12 team left. That includes a win over <coughs> Xavier from the Big East. Um, of course, now it gets even tougher. They uh, have to uh, go to Kansas this Sunday. Uh, that's it's going to be a tough one if they can get over that hurdle. And then uh, they get welcomed with their first Pac-12 game against their in-state rival, Arizona. Washington State um, has a, a top 25 win over St. Mary's. But St. Mary's has fallen off quite a bit. But then they turned around and lost to UC Davis by 14. So there's no, nobody really else that much in the next fall. Here's our uh, daily phone call on Jim's home phone. Uh, I need to tell my bookie to call later. Yeah, the Colorado uh, has only lost to the rival Colorado State. We can give a flip on that. But they have to face Xavier this this Saturday in Cincinnati. They did up something to be a little different. Utah's been solid but unimpressive. They lost to UNLV. Uh, they've got Butler tonight, which might show a thing or two. Washington could be on the rise. They've got their new coach, longtime Syracuse assistant, Mike Hoffman. They may need some time to gel, but the 6-2 start, their only losses are Providence and Virginia Tech. They're going to be tested. They've got Virginia, uh, excuse me, Kansas tomorrow and Gonzaga on Sunday. They're both at home, but uh, I think they're a year or two away. Oregon State's already lost three and hasn't played anybody in Teams that we used to talk about in the NCAA, Stanford and Cal, already have losing records. Um, you know, at least the Cardinals' losses are to North Carolina, Florida, 
and the Ohio State team you mentioned, which has been a surprise, uh, and Cal dropped three. They've lost to Wichita State, Virginia Commonwealth, and St. Mary's. But they've lost to UC Riverside and, and fell to Chaminade and, and the Maui Jinx. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Pac-12 plays out. They, they might be headed back to being one of the lesser known of the big six conferences. But uh, there's a lot of season left. And we're hoping that they can get back to the relevancy they had last year. Yeah, to echo your thoughts, I think Steve Alford probably was very happy with the news that came out regarding that family uh, yesterday, pulling uh, one of the players out. And actually, the youngest player of that family is uh, is already signed, but he's two years out now. Some people think that he may not even attend. UCLA, and I'm sure, again, Steve Alford probably is thinking, I don't need the distractions. Yeah, I think that's a, a major issue out there at UCLA. Again, of course, the older brother of that family helped make them relevant again last year. But, yeah, I think the distractions uh, Alford could uh, do without. But, yeah, I, I think you're you're spot on that the, the Pac-12 is just uh, – probably uh, going to be in a cycle this year where they're, they're going to be down, where they're not going to have uh, five or six uh, NCAA entrants this year. Well, who you got next for us? I was going to talk about uh, probably my best uh, next, which would be the Big 12. And, uh, wow, you look at this conference, and uh, I always enjoy watching this conference during the season because it's just uh, – it's brutal. Uh, I mean, you go all the way down uh, one through ten, and all of these programs have uh, significant basketball uh, programs on their campuses. Uh, we always talk about Kansas. Of course, uh, they're, they're at the top, and uh, – I think they're going for their, I believe it's 14th straight uh, championship or co-championship in the Big 12, and most expect them to repeat. Of course, they started the season off by beating the U.K. Wildcats, and yeah, interesting game. It'll be uh, Arizona State, the upstart uh, Sun Devils, who have gotten off to a great start. And of course, I saw out in the desert as they defeated handily that day, the Xavier Musketeers. So it'll be interesting to see what they can give the uh, Jayhawks. And I believe that game is uh, scheduled for uh, this Sunday. I, th- I believe it's in Kansas or it might be a, a neutral site. But uh, you go on down, TCU uh, hadn't really played the schedule, but they're off to an 8 no start. West Virginia, of course, had that early loss to Texas A&M, which, of course, is uh, I'm sure you'll talk a little bit about when you talk about the SEC, that early game over in Germany. But since uh, the Mountaineers have reeled off seven straight wins under Bobby Huggins, and with that defense, we know that they will uh, be uh, a tough team. Kansas State, I saw them out in the desert, and actually uh, their only loss is to that Arizona State team that we uh, talked about. And I was very impressed. I only watched the first half of that game, but Kansas State uh, kind of pushed Arizona State around that first half. In fact, I was somewhat surprised when Arizona State came back and won that game. you got Oklahoma State. They're off to a 7-1 and one start, and their only loss is to Texas A&M, who I have ranked number seven this week, I believe, so at 7-0. and uh, Texas Tech, their only loss, they're 6-1. and one. Their only loss is to that great Seton Hall team that we've talked about. Oklahoma's off to a 6-1 and one start. Baylor, of course, 6-2, and two, but you, you mentioned it earlier. Those losses, uh, one at Xavier, of course, a tough environment, and then uh, just lost uh, Saturday to the team Wichita State, who many are picking to be a Final Four participant this year. So even though they're 6-2, and two, uh, they're off to a good start. Iowa State 5-2, and two, and Texas, who we uh, I keep waiting to really uh, uh, jump back into relevance with Shaka Smart. Uh, in fact, they beat uh, Butler. And their losses are to Duke and Gonzaga, and the Gonzaga loss was in overtime. And just an interesting tidbit I saw where actually Texas is visiting Virginia Commonwealth tonight. So Shaka Smart taking his new team back into his old digs, and I'm sure that'll be an emotional thing for him as, of course, he made his name uh, at that uh, school, taking them deep into the tournament a couple years. Yep, yep, a, 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 um, a tough, tough division to be be sure. 
and we'll just have to see how things play out. Uh, yeah, they just sort of beat the snot out of each other uh, every year. Um, that leads me into the, uh, you know, the the one comment I make. We we keep talking about it. It seems like maybe the American <coughs> Athletic Conference, you know, it might be a little more relevant this year. They got Cincinnati, with South State, SMU that you mentioned. It's doing pretty well. Hopefully UConn can come back. Memphis is good, but uh, again, we'll, we'll have to see they've done well in the pre-conference. But that leads me into the the, the SEC, and, and this is a conference, even though they're five and nine against top 25 teams, they're willing to play uh, the tough teams early. And uh, they do have three teams in the top nine, Florida, you know, they seem to be the rising star of the group with a win over Gonzaga and a close loss to Duke in the PK-80. Um, that might change a little bit with them getting thumped by Florida State last night. Um, and the, of course, that's an in-state rival game, but still, that's ACC, SEC challenge. And uh, they seem to, people have clued in on their reliance on the three. And we'll find out uh, maybe a little bit more when they come to Cincinnati this Saturday. Uh, you know, Mike White will have them in, in the mix by the end of the year. Like you've already mentioned the, one of the big uh, – it's not that big of a surprise because he had them in the hunt last year, but they've really risen far as the Texas A&M. Billy Kennedy's got them at number seven, as you mentioned, 7-0. and The win in Germany over West Virginia and against Southern Cal, big test. Tonight for them against Arizona. Again, this is a chance for Arizona to to bounce back. But they play a real nice mix of explosive offense and solid defense. So Texas A&M is you know usually known as a football school is building a nice reputation for basketball. And another pleasant surprise has been the Tennessee Volunteers who popped into the top 25 for the first time in a long time this week. They've got wins over Purdue, Georgia Tech and North Carolina State, a close loss to Villanova. That's all put them on the radar. Of course, they have a non-conference game coming up. Jim, you sound like you're in the dentist's office and they're sucking, uh, using that little suction tool. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on. But... And your bookie is very persistent. Uh, they got the non-conference the farm deals coming up, and that'll let us know where they really are. Mississippi, uh, Seven and zero. They're only uh, excuse me. Just eight. They're only win and note is Dayton, and that was just by two. Now they are the second team to come to Cincinnati this week to visit the Bearcats on Tuesday. John California Sports has the Wildcats at seven and one, but their only loss being to Kansas. Uh, and all the schedules they have in the past, but uh, that changes soon. In a two weeks start, they have to play Virginia Tech, UCLA, and Louisville before they start SEC play. Auburn and Georgia are both at six and one. Uh, Georgia defeated the then ranked but now swooning St. Mary's team. Of course, their prize is they get to open against Kentucky in the SEC. Looks like Avery Johnson was ready to make a move with Alabama, a short-sighted. Lost to uh, Minnesota, we talked about a couple weeks ago, notwithstanding, but then they turn around and drop their last game to Central Florida. They just dropped out of the top 25. Only Vanderbilt has a losing record at 3-5, and five, but two of those losses are to rank opponents, Southern Cal and Seton Hall, and another close one to Kansas State. Frank Martin's in rebuilding mode at, at South Carolina. Mizzou tried to make some noise. Um, but they've lost to West Virginia. Arkansas, it's not the Razorbacks of old. And LSU and Ole Miss are probably already looking forward to the 2018 football season, uh, even though they'll have some strong wins. Andy, you know, Andy Kennedy usually gets a, a couple of uh, surprises there at Ole Miss. But it'll be the usual knock it out and punch each other in the nose SEC season and probably come down to the last week. But uh, still, a strong squad, maybe not as strong as they've been in the past, though. All right. Yeah, I don't know if the Wildcats are quite as uh, strong as they have been. Uh, time will only tell. Of course, that they lost to Kansas, but they really haven't played anybody uh, too challenging since then. 
Well, I'm going to move to my favorite conference, the Big East, uh, and do a quick run through. Uh, Villanova, of course, uh, is expected to win it and off to an 8 0 start in non conference. They do have a little bit of a challenge tonight against Gonzaga, although I think Gonzaga not quite as uh, highly regarded as they were last year, of course, making it to the national championship game. But uh, this is a game that pits the two national ran- runners up from the, or actually, no, a national champion. Villanova won it, and Gonzaga finished second uh, last year. Uh, Georgetown out to a 6 0 start, have not played anybody, but again, that program being hopefully resurrected by Patrick Ewing. Uh, it'll be interesting when he gets into league play, but it'll be interesting to see if maybe this uh, schedule that they've had some success against will uh, help them springboard into the Big East schedule. And I expect them to be a little more relevant, maybe right around the 500 mark. Seton Hall uh, just beat Louisville, and uh, they're off to a 7-1 and start and kind of where we expected. A uh, team that I'm still kind of wary about, uh, St. John, 7-1. and one. They're only lost to Missouri. Other than that, they really haven't played that challenging of a schedule again. Chris Mullen, like Patrick Ewing, trying to get the Red Storm back to relevancy and being able to contend in the Big East. Xavier, of course, uh, that lost Arizona State now, not looking so bad, especially when they came back and beat two ranked teams fairly highly ranked teams in Baylor and UC. So the Musketeers uh, definitely will challenge uh, Villanova, I think, for that top spot. Butler, uh, again, there was a lot of unknown, but they're off to a 6-2 and two start. And, of course, that big win over uh, rejuvenated Ohio State and their old coach, Chris Holtman. Uh, Providence off to 6-2, and two, which we kind of expect. Creighton, 5-2, and two, but a couple big wins over UCLA and Northwestern. Marquette five and three, but two of those losses to highly ranked teams in Purdue and Wichita State. I think they're again about a year away. They got a lot of young players. And DePaul, of course, uh, DePaul, DePaul three and four, bringing up the rear of the uh, Big East. Uh, but again, Big East, kind of like the Big Twelve. It's uh, it's a brutal. Everybody plays everybody twice, and uh, they kind of beat up on each other. And there's one bet, probably the one that my bookie keeps calling about, is I could tell you I don't think the champion of the Big East will have an undefeated uh, uh, record in the Big East. In fact, I would almost say the champion will have two or three losses uh, this year because it's just a brutal league. Well, that, that's the beauty of having that uh, that double conference schedule. You, you just can't escape it. and. And I'm with you. It'll be interesting to see what uh, St. John's does this Friday against Arizona State. Arizona State seems to be playing a lot of the teams in, in the Big East. They've got them that will sort of tell maybe the middle of both. And, of course, <clears throat> you brought up uh, one of our broadcasts last week, the, the mascots that don't end in uh, S, and the Redmen are, are one of them. Red Storm. Uh, Red Storm now, yeah, they're the Redmen. Uh, I almost said that too. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it, 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 it all. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that on our our Trog cast on uh, on Thursday. The things in the Big East, and also the fact that uh, uh, it's going to be a strong year, but that there's still some unknowns. That leads us into the what I think is the strongest conference. I know you're pushing for the Big Twelve, but I really don't think you can look past the ACC this year. They're already five and four against top 25 teams, and they got five teams in the top 25. This is a, a group that sent you know, more than half of its conference to the NCAA that last year and, and very well could do it again this year. Um, as you already mentioned, the, the, the challenge against the Big Ten wasn't a challenge this year, and that's nothing against the Big Ten. They are down, but I think that also speaks to the strength of the ACC. Uh, Duke, a unanimous number one, already 10-0. That, that's something that surprises me, Jim. You know, we're just in the first week of December, and Duke's already played 10 games. But they also have wins over Michigan State, Florida, Indiana, Texas. And their only scare, really, was the first half against Portland State in the PK-80 Invitational. You know, some people are talking about them going undefeated. That's not going to happen. But they're not going to have... Uh, many losses on their schedule. They're just going to get stronger as the year goes on, and, and they lost some uh, some key players like Luke Kennard, who went to the the uh, Detroit Pistons. Mm-hmm. Notre Dame, like you mentioned, dropped from number five to number nine with a stumble against number two, 
Michigan State, but they're the team that's handed Wichita State their only loss, and that was after they were down 14 at the half. They've got in-state Indiana coming up at their neutral site, that uh, that four-pack that they do in Indiana, which Chris Holton wants to get started in Ohio uh, before they get going. Again, this is something I don't understand. Yeah, Michigan beat them fairly handily. Um, you know, you know, we'll talk about Cincy and Xavier a little bit. You know, Cincy loses and drops six spots to a team that was behind them. But Notre Dame, you know, drops four spots by losing to a team that's in front of them, something we could talk about a lot. Uh, Jim Laranaga's Miami Hurricane at 7-0 and and ranked number 10, and they put it to number 12, Minnesota. Um, and they've got no real challenge left before they, they host Pitt to start ACC play on the 30th. Uh, and, and at that point, they might want to uh, say a little something about Pitt upsetting the Hurricanes in football. But uh, they're going to be there at the end and be strong. North Carolina, who a lot of people, even though they're national champions, have, have sort of downplayed. They're still there at number 11. Um, and you would think they're lower. They have struggled a little bit, but their only loss is to Michigan State. Uh, we'll find out a little bit about them as we talk about their, their at number 24, Tennessee, coming up and they'll be hosting Ohio State on the, the 23rd before they start league play. Virginia has uh, crept back in. Tony Bennett's got them playing stellar defense, and they're 8-0 and and number 15. They beat BCU. And then that famous watching paint dry victory we talked about over Wisconsin last week, and they'll find out tonight in that little cross-state rivalry. They've got uh, number – they've got to go to West Virginia – and play the number 18 Bobby Huggins squad, and I'll tell them. Florida State has held its own at 6-0. They really haven't gotten any love in the polls due to a week's schedule, but last night's pacing of Florida might just change that. Uh, of course, uh, their, their gift there will be opening ACC play against Duke. Uh, Clemson squad made some noise at the end of last year, and they're at 7-1. and one. They got a good win against that Ohio State team we talked about. But not a really strong free conference schedule, and they've lost to Temple. Buzz Williams has Virginia Tech at 7-1. and one. Uh, No really big wins, and a loss to St. Louis. And we've got that December 16th matchup against Kentucky to let them know where they are. Syracuse at 6-1, and one, and they're only lost to Kansas, but they lost Geno Thorpe this week, who left the Orange for personal reasons. He was a graduate transfer from South Florida, and Jim Beheim's been kind of relying on those guys in the past couple of years, and he only has eight scholarship players left on his squad. So it might be a tough year for Syracuse, but you're dealing with the master there with Jim Beheim. He always seems to find a way to get him ready toward the end. North Carolina State Wolfpack 7-2, and, of course, uh, they're part of our scary moment of the week. We talked about our losses to Tennessee is one of them. Uh, really nobody to impress before they start with Clemson. Boston College already has three losses and probably a fourth after facing Duke on Saturday. <laughs> but they're still ahead of a very despondent Louisville team, which is, uh, which is a sad thing. You know, they got losses to Purdue and Seton Hall, which aren't shockers, but they've dropped out of the top 25. But what won't go away is that FBI probe. Um, you know, they, they've announced that the Bowen fell out, won't play for them and he's free to transfer, but Rick Pitino in the news. He, he has sued the University of Louisville for breach of contract this week, claiming the $37.6 million that he's owed by his contract. That's added to a suit that he's made against Adidas, saying the manufacturer had improper dealings with U of L recruits. So it could be a long year down the river from us, uh, Dave Patchett, trying to get the, the train on the tracks, but it just seems like uh, they can't get out of that shadow. Georgia Tech and Pitt, and a rather disappointing Wake Forest, I thought uh, Danny Manning would have them a little stronger there. They might already be in wait until next year mode. But still, the strongest conference, I think, in the country, and you're going to hear a lot more out of them as, as time goes. Well, I uh, agree that they are, if not the strongest conference, at least uh, top two uh, and uh, I have seen Duke play a little bit. I do believe they are the best team in the country and deserve that number one ranking. And if anybody could go undefeated, it probably 
will be the Blue Devils, although I'm like you, I just don't think that's even possible anymore just with the parity in uh, college basketball that you're going to have an off day and, of course, going on the road in that conference gets tough. So uh, I agree there. A uh, couple side notes. Uh, Buzz Williams, I've, there's a report, and I have not seen this at all. I have not seen them play, but supposedly Buzz Williams now has hair. Now, I was listening to a talk show that said, can you use the name Buzz if you grow hair? But then they came back and said that he re- he wasn't given that nickname because he always had a Buzz haircut. It was because of his energy and the way he acted. That's how he picked that nickname up. So we'll have to check that out if you see the uh, Hokies play on the on the tube, see if he really does have hair. And, uh, yeah, going to Louisville, I think uh, just so many distractions there. In fact, uh, kind of a side note, I did see kind of uh, – humorous a little bit that uh, when they went to Purdue, all the Purdue, the student section, all had T-shirts that across the front said FBI. So, again, that distraction is not going to go away this season, and uh, I think it's going to be a so-so season for the Cardinals. Obviously have a lot of talent there, but, yeah, with the uh, late firing of Rick Pitino and just everything, but that program's dealt with really, let's remember, this is just, this is the second big scandal. You know, they were just coming out of the uh, scandal from the uh, book about with the prostitutes and the recruits and all that, that uh, they seem to have cleared that hurdle and now got hit uh, smack dab in the face with this FBI investigation. So, uh, but I, I'll give it to you. The ACC is probably the conference to watch this year. <laughs> Well, it's going to be interesting, and, and, and you know that's sort of the FBI. Sure, that brings us to a little bit of news of the week, and we'll talk a lot more, I'm sure, about this on Thursday on our Razor Cast. But the end of the, the Xavier Cincinnati game, and what you would hope when we talked about, we thought things had finally calmed down, but little testiness there between J.P. McCurra and Cincy coach Mick Cronin. You always hope that uh, you can keep these things, but that's been the buzz that. Um, there was some language used, and Mick Cronin decided to let J.P. McCurra know about that rather testily and at the end of the game. And I'm sure you got a lot to say. We might have to save some of it for, like I said, our, our razor cast. But your quick thoughts on the testy moment of the week? Um, yeah, it was uh, obviously an ugly moment uh, caught on uh, film. I mean, the, the thing that it really wasn't an issue in anybody's mind uh, too much until the end of the game when supposedly uh, Mick refused or walked away from JP, wouldn't shake his hand. JP supposedly uttered a comment to him. Uh, I think uh, this this had a bad optic for UC. Mick actually trying to get physical with JP, and that, of course, was caught on tape, and that doesn't look good for uh, him or the university. Uh, I, I wasn't... Uh, you know, mixed reaction. Uh, again, here's here's the positive. I think it's it's pretty much it's passed. I think it's going to die down. I haven't heard anything. You know, first originally I got home from the game and uh, all the uh, TV coverages were on their halftime shows. were talking about it. Didn't like that, especially from the fallout of the fight uh, five or six years ago. How that you know gave the nation a, a view of this. Uh, I really like. Chris Mack's reaction because uh, I think he did a good job. He came in, he said, "We're not talking about this. This is I don't want this to be the narrative." He defended his player, uh, and here's the probably the smartest movie made. Probably a, a learned lesson from the the fallout of the brawl. If you recall, back in the brawl, he sent uh, two Holloway and Mark Lyons out to talk about it, and they said some things that made it even worse, and and some things they probably shouldn't have said. Uh, he refused to let J.P. McCurra talk about it. I think that was a great decision because J.P. was probably emotionally charged too, and you never know what a 21, 22-year-old uh, uh, kid really is going to say after that and, you know, the whole emotions of winning the game. So he just said, no, J.P. McCurra is not coming out here and you're not speaking to him, which he has the authority to do. I think that was a great, uh, great move on his part to try to, you know, keep it from escalating. And and the other thing is kind of a humorous. The, uh, the he told the story about Lance Stevenson, and uh, Lance Stevenson is probably like I don't want to be associated with this. Uh, and you probably read that supposedly Lance Stevenson had called Chris Mack some names during a game in 2010, 
And uh, Chris Mack said, and I didn't make an issue of it. I shook his hand after the game, and, and we went on. Of course, Lance Stevenson did say, I don't remember saying that, but I will tell you I probably did say something negative toward him, but I think I would have remembered if I would have said that to him. But So, again, the positives, and we'll probably, again, we'll get, I'm sure, deeper into it on Thursday with our Razor cast. Uh, is that it seems to have died down. Although on a final note, I was listening to some ro- local radio talk uh, yesterday, and I don't even remember who it was, but made the comment, this is great. And you think, what? And I said, this is great because this just proves that this is a hated rivalry. And again, he said next year it's going to come back up. All this is going to be replayed before they play again next year. And he, and. This, this personality said, that's great, because it, I think, brings more attention to the rivalry. So it is, a, as we've talked about before, a heated rivalry. Again, I think it's probably done now, and uh, hopefully mo- both programs, which should have great years, uh, can put it behind them and move forward. Well, I'm going to disagree with you just a little bit. I think it's a, there's plenty of blame to go around, and I, I don't want, uh, especially these, these two great institutions of which I'm a alum of both, to, to have the narrative be that somebody was dropping the F-bomb of the coach and the coach was charging. It, was, uh, it wasn't a, a great game because Xavier blew him out, and I wish that was what we been talking about. You had two top 25 teams playing each other, and this becomes a narrative. I hope that Mick Cronin can reflect on his anger. He's the adult in the situation and should not have done that, even though we've seen people like uh, Coach K. Uh, refused to shake people's hands against Syracuse a couple of years ago and also, you know, pulled Dylan Brooks aside against Oregon and, and, and mentioned something to him after a, a tournament loss two, two years ago. And Dylan Brooks says that's the best thing that could have happened to him, maybe a quiet word by the adult. But I also uh, <clears throat> hope that Chris Mack can pull J.P. McCurra aside and say, hey, I love your spirit, young man, and you're, you're a great spark plug for the team, but – Let's choose our, our places wisely. It's becoming a pattern with him, and I don't want him to become the Grace and Allen of this year where all the focus is going to be on what he's saying and, and his play. I want it to be about the play. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But I, I'd rather the focus be on uh, basketball rather than this. And, yeah, there are other fans out there going, hey, this is great. Everybody's looking at Cincinnati. But uh, I, I don't want them looking at, at Cincinnati for those reasons. And we'll – like I said, we'll go into a lot more. I'm sure you might have a comment or two on what I said, but we'll uh, do a lot more on Thursday. Now, nah, well, we'll go into it. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, again, an unfortunate situation. You wish it wouldn't have happened. Um, JP McKira, I've, I've watched him play now, going on four years, and actually, that's kind of his his mantra. He, he likes to get under people's skin. Uh, you can tell. You watch him and. and and you don't really see him say things, but you know things are being said yeah. under his breath because you always see other players especially react to him. And if there's a scuffle on the floor, uh, he's usually involved. Although I will give him some kudos. There was a – I think it was uh, Najee Marshall was driving to the basket and got a hard foul from a UC player, and they kind of went down on the floor – and as they started to get up, Jay P. McCura actually stepped in to pull Najee away from the player to make sure that that didn't escalate. So uh, my nickname and my thought is uh, he, he reminds me of Dennis the Menace, always uh, trying to get Mr. Wilson to, <laughs> you know, get, get something over on him uh, in kind of a sly way. And uh, so, uh, again, I'm sure that um, Chris Mack had uh, – you know, a little bit of a talk with JP that, you know, there is a line, especially when it comes to coaches, you know, trash talking, we can debate that, whether that's okay or goes on. We know it goes on between players, but I think you cross a line uh, when you speak to an opposing coach and vice versa, when an opposing coach talks to other players, I, you know, you and I have both coached and and that just, I think is totally out of line. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. uh, We can, I'm sure. We'll talk a lot more on Thursday. What we say because that's the big game of the week, and we can't you know, can't leave without acknowledging the scary moment of the week. South Carolina State player Tavoris Solomon, who collapsed in their game against North Carolina State, <clears throat> had to receive uh, had to be re- revived. Actually, he had stopped breathing, but now um, a nice report today in 
uh, ESPN that he is up and around. He is still in the hospital. They're trying to figure out what some of the, the things that have happened, but the medical staff took good care of it, put a pall over that. So we're wishing the best to divorce Solomon as he recovers. And also, uh, you know, I think they did the right thing in that they continued the game. It's a little bit of a dark thing, but um, just like in uh, the unfortunate uh, pull-off in last night's Bengals-Steelers games where two people had to be taken off in the cart, uh, you hope these things don't happen, but they're, uh, uh, you, 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 the show must go on, as it were. And he did, did survive. If he had unfortunately passed away, it might be a different thing. But uh, we're, we're going to wish Tavoris the best in his recovery. Yeah, just a comment about that. Uh, the unsung hero there was the uh, South Carolina State trainer. Uh, he used two things, uh, CPR, which we're all familiar with, and then another a device that is becoming more and more common, and even at the uh, high school and youth level, is an AED, which is a, a machine, a kind of a portable machine that you can shock someone who is having cardiac arrest to uh, get their heart beating again, and they did use that. In fact, I'm not even sure if, if you're aware of this, Jeff, but in the state of Ohio just last summer, I believe a law was passed. It's called Lindsay's Law, and every high school and youth coach That's in the state so of Ohio has to have training on how to recognize and deal with uh, sudden cardiac arrest to see what the signs are because sometimes – uh, if you don't realize what's going on, if you just think an athlete is out of breath or tired or dogging it, you may not realize what's going on. And that law is actually named after Lindsay Davis, a former Miss Ohio, and uh, she suffers from a heart condition. So she's the one that was very instrumental in getting that passed. Uh, so, again, it's yeah, great outcome to that. Uh, and, of course, you and I both go back to we remember the great Hank Gathers who played for that Loyola Marymount team. Uh, how he uh, collapsed and, and died. That's been, what, probably 30 years ago. But, yeah, the, the AED, I'm not even sure what that, I think the last letter is defibrillator or something. Uh, those are just, you know, they're everywhere now. And, and it's a great, you know, medicine, medical uh, CP, or, uh, medical emergency people have uh, this tool now that they can really, you know, again, if, if that wouldn't have been there, uh, we may be talking about a, a sad outcome to that story. Yeah. Again, we wish him well. And now um, you can join us for our, our Razor cast about all things Xavier basketball and, and talk about the Big East and what's going on there on Thursday. And we'll be back next Tuesday with our next uh, Trog cast. But in the meantime, I'm sure Jim has, has thought up a, a, a little something to keep us interested on the trivia side. Well, we got back to the conference, and I've uh, sometimes given you Big Ten trivia, Big East trivia, but today I thought I would uh, try to pull out a little Big 12 trivia. Of course, the Big 12 has 10 teams and originally was the Big 8 and some teams left and some teams joined and they're at 10 now. But anyway, I'm going to give you some hints of a great player who played in probably was it was definitely called the Big 8 at the time. But uh, I'll give you some hints, see how far we go before you can uh, tell me who this player is I'm speaking of. This player played for the Kansas Jayhawks. That doesn't limit it down to too much. <laughs> Keep he, going. Only he only played two years. The one reason was freshmen were not allowed to play, and he left at the end of his junior year. Well, he left. Oh, very good. Okay, so this is a layered one. Go ahead and say all the other things you said, but I got a feeling where you're kind of going there. Um, <laughs> do do, when do he, you know there who he left to play for? Because he couldn't play professional basketball at that time. Couldn't play the NBA, but he did play professional basketball. Who did he play for? Harlem Globetrotters. Very good. That was my next question. Do you know what his his – favorite nickname was he had several of course the one we probably all remember is wilt the stilt but he had another nickname that he liked better than that do you know what that was i'm, I'm going to guess that it was the big dipper the big so. dipper very good jeff you are on a roll do you know where that name came from uh no i don't but i'm sure you're about to tell us 
uh, when he would walk through a doorway, and of course he was seven one, uh, he had to dip his head most of the time to get through uh, the doorway. So that's where people in high school actually started calling the Big Dipper, and that of course that was his favorite, famous favorite, excuse me, nickname. Of course, uh, Wilt Chamberlain played in a national championship game, the uh, storied triple overtime game against the North Carolina uh, Tar Heels. Uh, He was such a dominant force in college that uh, a lot of times teams started stalling just to shorten the game so he wouldn't have as many opportunities to score. And also, he was triple teamed a lot of the times. In fact, he left early, of course, to make money to uh, help his family. But another reason he left early, supposedly, was the college game was no longer any fun for him because of the way uh, teams were defending him and, and playing against him. But number 13, of course, uh, the Kansas Jayhawks have retired that number, the famous number 13 that he wore uh, during college and all through his pro career. He was with the Warriors, um, somebody else, the 76ers. And then, of course, I remember him as a kid. Uh, he was the central piece of the Los Angeles Lakers. But this, I'll give you one last fact about Wilt Chamberlain, and this is just amazing. In his two years at Kansas, his average, average over those two years, 29 points per game, 18 rebound so a little uh big eight big 12 wilt chamberlain trivia for you today yeah and this is a guy that uh, you know averaged 50 points a season in the nba as well so kind of and actually scored 100 points. once yeah and he even scored 100 we talked about that on a previous part a couple uh tidbits here as we we head out a couple of tough dates for teams on december 4th tough date for the new york knicks in 1961 they played in front of their smallest crowd at Madison Square Garden ever, just 1,300 people due to a massive snowstorm. And then, unfortunately, on that date, four years later, they had to cancel their game against the Philadelphia 76ers, sort of in line with what we were just talking about with Tyvoris Solomon. That turned out better. But Ike Richmond, the 76ers co-owner, had collapsed from a heart attack and died courtside at Boston Garden just two days before. And December 5th, unfortunately, is a bad news day for uh, – a heavyweight champion, and a good news day for another one if you want to look at it. Uh, it's on December 5th in 1947 that Jersey Joe Walcott lost his title to Joe Lewis. And then two years later, he lost the title again to Cincinnati native Ezard Charles. Uh, Charles might be the lucky day for him because um, one year later he won the defended his title against Nick Barone with a knockout in the 11th inning. So I don't know why December 5th was such a big date. There must be some reason. And good news for almost everyone, especially this time of year, is on this date, 1933, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution was repealed by the 21st Amendment to the Constitution. Now, before sports fans think we're going all political, the 21st Amendment ended prohibition. So we can raise a glass to that. And, of course, we hope you all either put out your shoes or hang up your stockings for tomorrow's great St. Nicholas Day. And, again, we will be back on Thursday with our RazorCast, all things Xavier basketball, and we can be joined on Tuesdays with the um, weekly Trogcast. So, Jim, enjoy your St. Nicholas Day, and we will talk to you on Thursday. All right. We'll see you, NCAA fans.